This is NHTV2, North Haven Government Television, a service of North Haven Community Television. The following program is brought to you through the support of the town of North Haven. I'd like to call the April 20th, 2023 regular meeting of the North Haven Board of Education to order at 6.30 p.m. May I have a motion to approve the March 9, 2023 Board of Education meeting minutes? So moved. Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Can you just show my abstention because I wasn't here right. at that meeting? You got it. Um, there is no student representative report tonight. So we're going to go straight to public comment. Uh, one thing I would like to say before we get to uh, the non-agenda items is that if anybody has a question about the budget, I would appreciate it. And I'm sure the people in the, uh, who attended today would appreciate if you hold that till the end and let some other questions come because we've done so much budget stuff over the last couple of months with uh, workshops, meetings, board of finance, meetings downstairs in the uh, auditorium. So if anybody has anything they would like to bring up other than an agenda item at this time, please stand, give your name. Anybody? Is it okay? That's okay, just yeah. Okay. Just give your name, your address. And Michelle Guglielmo, 26 Curtis Court. Thank you. My name is Michelle Guglielmo and I live at 26 Curtis Court. I would like to make my comments tonight. I would like my, I'm sorry. That's right, take your time, take your time. I would like my comments tonight to be entered formally into the record and reflected in the minutes for this meeting. I wanna start by thanking the board for all of your hard work. Being a board member is difficult, voluntary, and unpaid. I know you dedicate a massive amount of your time to the work you do here, and I commend you for that. While this is the first time you are hearing from me in person, you have heard from me before. I have sent emails of appreciation for the hard work that you did during the pandemic. I also reached out in October to request the extension of free meals for all students, and I was very grateful that you heard my plea and voted to do so. I also reached out recently regarding the reason I am here to speak tonight. Thank you, Amanda, for your email. I truly appreciate your kind words. I am here to speak tonight about an incident that occurred with my son on March 8th while in the care of M&J Bussing. I know that the board is aware of this incident already, so I will summarize for the sake of public record. On March 8th, my son was to take the van home. My son was driven back to M&J Garage and was left asleep in the van. My son woke up alone in the van. He panicked, cried, and yelled for help. He then unbuckled himself, climbed out of the driver's door, and found someone to ask for help. As you can imagine, I was horrified by this. This is the type of thing you see on the news and never think could happen to your child. I am here to make everyone aware it can happen anywhere to anyone, even in our wonderful school district like North Haven. I am here tonight as part of my mission to ensure that this never happens to another family in this town ever again. In light of this incident, M&J Bussing has reactively implemented some new policies. But how can I be assured that they will follow their own policies? They had an explicit policy in place before this incident to ensure their drivers check their vehicles for sleeping children. And yet my son was left asleep in a vehicle. The driver attended a training specifically about checking vehicles for sleeping children in February. And just two weeks later, he was left sleeping in a vehicle. Their policy and training was not enough to prevent this from happening to my son. Unfortunately, this is not the first time I've had concerns over M&J busing. My daughter's school requested video in December for a serious bus incident. M&J took weeks to get back to administration and then said nothing was available, possibly due to an IT glitch. This is unacceptable. The response from M&J following this incident with my son has been abysmal. They have reached out to me just once, nearly a week after the incident, and mainly at the request of myself and Mr. Stirk. In my opinion, they have been purposely vague and not transparent in answering many questions I asked following the incident. While I have agonized over this for the past five weeks, I feel as though M&J is just back to business as usual. Because let's be real, a bus company is a business, one that you as a board makes the decision to hire. 
and they can say all they want that their number one priority is the safety of our children, but the bottom line is that they are a for-profit business that we, as a district, pay a lot of money to do a very important job. While I do not typically attend Board of Ed meetings in person, I watch every single one. I watched the February 9th meeting where the general manager of M&J, Mr. Hipsher, came to speak and answer your questions regarding transportation. I went back and rewatched the meeting after the incident with my son. There are a couple of things that stood out that Mr. Hipsher said. He said, quote, always the most important thing, and this is why we really labor when we're trying to plan out how an afternoon works, is that we have to make sure everything we are moving is safe. Precious cargo, everything's gotta be based on safety. He also replied to one of your questions with, quote, because we are not going to sacrifice safety one bit along the way. Multiple board members mentioned that they agree that safety is most important. And then 27 days later, my son was left sleeping alone on a van at the M&J garage. Not now knowing of this incident, I highly suggest you go back and rewatch that February 9th meeting and see how you feel about some of the replies to your questions. You may want to consider inviting Mr. Hipsher back soon to answer more questions. If you do, I will be in attendance. So what can you as a board do to help ensure this never happens again? Here are some things I'm requesting you consider. No longer use M&J as our company, or at the very least, explore other options. Go out to bid, see what else is available. I am a teacher in a neighboring district, and we just switched bus companies this year. Yes, the transition was challenging in the beginning as expected, but people are much happier with the new company. Yes, changing companies can cost more, but can we really put a price on the safety of our children? In the event you decide to renew the contract with M&J, I implore you to find a way to hold them accountable for their policies. Maybe this includes random visits and observations to make sure that vehicle checks are actually being done. Maybe it's the district hiring someone to serve as a transportation liaison of sorts that would be in charge of oversight for all things transportation or something else, I don't know, but something needs to be done to make sure they are following their own policies. I would be happy to be part of any conversations that may happen surrounding this accountability. I also feel as though there should be a monitor on every bus and van. I know this comes at a cost to the district, but again, can we really put a price on this? A second person on my son's van would have likely prevented this from happening. If we cannot afford to accomplish two adults on every vehicle, then I want there to be a person specifically hired to check vehicles as they come back to the depot. One person whose only responsibility is to do this important check that the drivers are supposed to do, but my son's driver failed to do. It is my understanding that M&J is now checking vehicles at the end of the day, but in my opinion, this is still not enough. It needs to happen the moment the vehicle pulls into the depot. Can we as a district afford to pay that salary if needed? Please consider finding a way to raise the bar for who is being hired to drive our children around town or to raise the training requirements. And this is not to take away from any of the amazing drivers who are out there because it is a very hard job that I myself could never do. And I appreciate all of the wonderful drivers out there. But someone dropped the ball big time here. And this was a driver for a special needs van. The what ifs are what keeps me up at night. What if the child had been nonverbal autistic? What if the child was medically fragile? What if the child didn't have a parent looking for them right away? What if it had happened in the deep freeze of the winter or unbearable June heat? What if it hadn't been my amazingly bright, smart, brave boy who decided to get himself out and look for help? I would also like to request that whatever bus company is being used that they keep up with, upgrade, maintain equipment and vehicles as needed. There's really no excuse in today's day and age that cameras are not present or not working or not recording. There should be cameras on every bus, every van, and covering every angle on the bus depot, including inside the garage. While I am not happy that this happened to my child and I wish it never did, I am hopeful that the pain my family has experienced will not be in vain. I have lived a parent's worst nightmare scenario these past five weeks. I have faith, but I have faith that this board will be as upset as I am and demand change and accountability. I know I am well over time, and I appreciate you giving me the time I needed. I will end on a positive note with some recognition. Mr. Stirk has been wonderful through this entire ordeal. I know he can be a man of few words, but even so, I know he has lost sleep over this as well. I know that it pains him to know this happened to my child or any child in his district. We are lucky to have him as our superintendent. Sandra Pernetta deserves the same praise. 
She has bent over backwards since March 8th to make sure she is doing everything she can to support my son and me. I know she loves my son like her own. And as always, the faculty at Montague School has been great as well. I know they all care deeply for my child. They were the same with my older child, and I also feel lucky to be a part of the Montague School community. I am happy to continue this conversation outside of this board meeting with anyone who so chooses. Thank you for your time and for considering my suggestions. I'm going to leave copies here for the record. Well, thank you very much for that. We can talk about this a little bit, sure. Okay. Because I would very much like to have an action plan from MJ on this board, like presented to this board. Um, I'm sorry, I just like. I'll well, it's an upsetting, it's an upsetting situation. There's no question about that. Just take a breath. Yep. Yeah, I, I too feel very strongly that we need to hold this company more accountable. I would encourage uh, reports from this company. I think your language was very well taken. They seem to be reactive, but I don't see proactive action plan for the deficits that we've already identified this year. I think the risk of harm with this company is very, very serious. And um, I personally feel um, the man who came to our February meeting should be coming more often to this meeting until we have confidence back that the kids who are on these buses and vans are safe. And I applaud this parent because she's come up with an action plan. In the February meeting, I asked him about an action plan and I didn't like his response. And yet we have a parent who came up with very concrete <coughs> steps. It's the least that he can meet those or at least have an explanation back to us. Otherwise, I think the risk of something like this happening again could happen. And I think that Ms. Guillermo's point is is very well taken. That like I, I want to make sure that this never happens again um, on our watch. I think more regular reports are are wonderful. Um, I think we have a year left in our contract with M and J. Um, so oh okay, more more than that, mm -hmm. two years left. Twenty five. Um, and, and, and to, to M&J's credit, they have hired some really fantastic bus drivers. We have some amazing people who are, are transporting our children. But I do think that the staffing shortages has caused maybe some bad decision making to, to happen here. And I would like, I understand that it's a difficult environment to hire people, but I want to plan. I want to plan to hire qualified people, like, and to hire enough qualified in order to be able to, to meet the needs and make sure that our kids are safe. I, I just want to, and it's not just a um, staff initiative, I don't feel. I think um, there are policies that seem not to be followed through. They have policies that they should be following, checking a van or a bus to see if there's a child left. I'm sure it is one of their safety policies. And if I was doing a root cause analysis on this, I would want to know where was the Swiss cheese holes? Was this person running late? I mean, sometimes these incidents aren't just because of not caring. There could be many circumstances, but if we don't have an action plan saying, okay, we recognize we may have to do retraining or we may have to have someone do a sign off. You know, in my healthcare world, when we're working with dangerous things, there's always a second person signing off on things. These are not hard solutions. This is going to cost them in jail. But it's going to at least start to build back the trust that we've lost with them. Well, I, our, our, my concern, I've spoken with Patrick about this several times, is not going to cost them and Jay to do their job right. That's on him. That's on him and Jay. Mm -hmm. And they just need to get their stuff together and, and get it correct. You know, when he sat here, again, as she noted, he said, we're going to do this, this, and the other thing. And it wasn't done. So. Beyond that, when we're having problems with sporting events getting back and forth, late delays from the kids coming back and forth to school, uh, we've already started to look at our options. So it's been something that's been going on for a couple of months now. Um, the thing about the buses is nothing really happens in a day, unfortunately, because there's it's so intertwined with everything that's already scheduled to get somebody to come in and over just take over a schedule without any 
lag is, is almost impossible. So we're trying to figure out the best case now on what to do with options other than MJ. And then once those are exhausted, um, we will have to get with MJ and demand some changes, which we've talked to them about already, immediately following this incident. But there are some things that are have to be contractually changed, I think, in the I future think as they continue. If I totally if appreciate continue. that. I mean, we are in a contract. It's a binding legal paper. I, I just advocate having him look at my face and come to these meetings and tell me what he's doing about this. He, he, he has, which is my concern, that he's going to come here and say it again. The problem is the, is the follow through and the uh, confirmation of the things that are getting done that he says are getting done. That's kind of where we're at now. I know he wants to make a comment. I just have a question. I know we had asked him a couple of questions that he was going to come back with answers. I don't remember exactly the questions we had. Um, is there a possibility for him to just report back what their plan is now that this happened and their actions? I can always call him back. I can always call him back. It's not an issue at all. Like so that we can have the discussion. We can, we can contact and maybe him share some of the. You know, between tomorrow, I don't know his schedule is, but between tomorrow and the next week, we'll see if he can come back. We can, we can easily or even if they can that. report back to us, like, okay, so this happened, now now what are you doing? About? You can do it in person. Sorry, sir, thanks. You can do it in person. I would rather probably see that. I mean, there's something on paper that's just right out loud. So, I'm just curious, so I understand we have two years left in the contract. Do we have a performance guarantee, like, built into that contract? So, yeah, Howard and I have been, no, 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 Howard and I have been in discussions with shipment to really her specialty is looking at contracts mm -hmm. and she has experience with uh, busing contracts so she's been helping us digest and see what uh, options the board has and I'll report that out very soon. Uh, you actually hit on uh, what I was going to say in and I, I actually I did rewatch just his portion of the board meeting after we found out about what happened and I left here after listening to him, I guess uneasy is a nice way to, to put how I felt about some of the stuff. And then seeing what happened a few weeks later and then rewatching it and listening to his answers, it's, I don't have any type of confidence that they're gonna do the things that they need to do to protect our kids. It was almost like a, I, I hate to say this, but like a snake oil salesman. It was like, he was telling us what we wanna hear what he thinks we need to hear, but there wasn't really anything behind it. And I don't think we've heard anything from, I mean, maybe you guys in the administration have, but I know if you did, you'd pass anything sailing it on to us. I don't think he's come back with anything compared to, you know, in, in response to the things we asked them. And that's cause for concern. And I, I forget, I, maybe it was you, Ron, or, or you, Patrick, I don't remember who I talked to about this, but my positions, Still is, and I could be dead wrong, and that's fine, but I think there's enough there from my lay perspective that they're in breach of the contract, and if there's any way we can get out of it and go out to bid and have a new busing, con uh, new busing contractor in place for the next school year, because that, you know, whatever, the 50 days left this year, there's nothing we can do, but next school year, I, I, I'm not really comfortable having M and J. And we also have summer school and some other um, demands that are coming up. In, yeah, in the and I, I don't know if it's plausible to get somebody in play to pick up, you know, what's in the next two or three months, but maybe to get someone in play for August or you, September. You had that conversation with myself and Patrick two different times. Yeah. And that's why the attorneys were called to verify that we can get out under performance basis. So that's, that's where, where we're at now. We're trying to figure out if we can and if we can, where to go. Because it, that, I think getting out is a lot simpler, in essence, than finding out where to go. Right. It's so no we're, we're, we are working on that. So, Ron, just out of curiosity, so even if, you know, can, can we run both at the same time? I mean, what stops us from exploring our options, from doing an R, and, and again, I'm, I'm learning, yeah. but what stops us from doing an RFP just to learn what our options are? We're doing that now. Oh, we are, are actively doing. searching. Oh, okay, you are actively yeah, We're actively okay. trying to figure out where we would go and how we would do it. Okay. So once we get 
the thumbs up from the attorney to say, yeah, you have every right to, to balance um, where to go. Thanks for the clear. Yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. There's a lot, it's a lot, a lot of turning gears in, in this thing. Um, and we're trying, to, we're trying to work it out, Patrick and Howard are really doing uh, a good job, but it may not seem like it's moving fast enough, but there are so many moving parts. Um, it's, it's a little more difficult than it appears. You know, you'd think you would just be able to say, yeah, you're out, next guy's in. So it's, just, it's just a little more than that. Although we are trying to track that movement and get that, get that completed as soon as we can. Anybody else like to speak? Okay, seeing none, move on. Do uh, we have parents for the board today? Hi. Hi, um, Kristen Cohen from um, PTA Council. Um, so not a whole lot going on with council right now. We do have our new townwide study strap fundraiser. I gave each of you one this evening. Um, that will be benefiting our special, special education committee. Um, the nominating committees for pretty much all of the schools are looking for new board members. So if anybody here or watching is interested in getting involved at your respective school, reach out to your PTA because they are looking for people. Um, one thing that will kind of affect um, all of our PTAs coming into next year is national PTA um, has a budget deficit, so they'll be raising dues by a couple of dollars for all the PTAs, which will then require PTA dues to be raised a little bit across the boards. Um, and the last thing is we have teacher appreciation coming up here shortly, so um, I know all the schools are also looking for help um, getting... May, May. May 8th, I believe, is the beginning of the week. Um, so yes, yeah, so looking first week, first, week. first week of May. Um, so they're looking for parents, volunteers um, who would like to help with um, treating their teachers. So that's all we have. You can I ask a question? A question. So I, I attended the, um, the PTA meeting for Clintonville okay. yesterday. Great experience. Um, one question that I have is, do the PTAs for the different schools, do they collaborate on programs? Yes. Or it's pretty much everybody just does their own program? So we have all six schools have their own individual PTA. Okay. And then PTA Council, which I'm co-president with Jen Gearing this year, um, we meet with all of the PTAs every six weeks-ish. Um, so all six schools meet um, during that meeting and discuss what's going on at their respective schools. They discuss what's working, what's not working. Um, and that's kind of our function as PTA Council is working with all of the schools together so that everybody's kind of working on the same team. Okay. Do they do yeah. collaborative programs together or it's pretty much everybody? We just... are trying to do more of those. Very little kind of happened during COVID. The um, study shop that I gave you this evening, that yes, is a collaborative that. program through um, PTA Council that all the PTAs are helping with. Um, in the past, we've done a road race that everybody worked together on. Um, this particular one is for our special education committee. So the special education committee is part of the um, PTA council. However, it benefits and works with all of the PTAs and actually is working um, with Patrick as well um, for some of that stuff. So um, yes, everybody, we do have efforts for everybody to work together. That was a really long answer to your question, sorry. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Patrick Lawrence has a presentation. He's the district DEIV facilitator. And, uh, there you go. <laughs> Patrick, I'm sorry I skipped you there. No, that's briefly. fine. I'm going to try to work on my um, outside voice and project on me. <laughs> I'm usually a very self spoken voice. person. <laughs> yeah, my classroom voice, so to speak. So, good evening, board and members um, and, and community and staff that's here. Um, my name is Patrick Lawrence. I'm uh, an assistant principal here at the uh, high school, as well as coordinator over diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Of course, we threw belonging in there because it's, it, it's really what we do. We, we want to make sure everyone belongs, uh, and you know, especially recognizing that. So um, what I'm going to do is just talk about more or less the D, E, I, and B journey that we've been taking here in North Haven, and starting with just some of the uh, beginning things that we did as a district, 
uh, beginning with uh, prior years of uh, getting some training as a um, training through CERT. All the admins did get this training and we did some online training and learned a little bit about uh, diversity, equity, inclusion at the top was called DEI. Of course, we're adding belonging because once again, the key is to show that in um, North Haven, everyone belongs. Um, now, since the start of this journey for me, um, I started a learning tour. You know, being at the high school, I got to see a lot of what's going on with diversity, and we have a diversity team here involving students and get the students' voice and, and they're plugged into many facets of the high school. Um, of course, I had to, you know, visited the middle school to see what was going on there, and also the other elementary schools within the district. Um, I, the findings was was pretty positive, you know, seeing that everyone was very motivated to do uh, the work. That we needed some guidance, we needed some direction. So, but everyone was, you know, doing various things as far as you know, supplying classrooms with things and teaching various lessons, and of course, uh, groups being formed. So we uh, there was a anti-racism. PLC book club that was formed and I became a part of that as well and it was a good um, run for a while. Uh, we developed a steering committee which consisted of myself, the superintendent, the assistant superintendent and the director of student services and we meet um, almost what, every other week or so and we just kind of talk about the different way we're going to kind of bring this work forward. Um, so again, teachers and staff, uh, you know, keep, you know, very excited about this. Our um, goal is really, well, just trying to get the communication, uh, uh, you know, to have everyone have that conversation about diversity, equity, inclusion, because it's uh, such a difficult thing to talk about. So I wanted to make sure everyone had that opportunity. So um, over the summer, last summer, I developed a presentation uh, that pretty much, you know, talked about all the work that I did as far as the reading and the researching and uh, did a course at, uh, E. Cornell, in that course, you know, did get a certain certificate to show that I finished the course, but I'm not an expert, I'm still learning, still learning. That's my mantra, learning and growing. So uh, we're developing this thing together. Um, so uh, that presentation was shared with the committee, the steering committee, and after that we talked about different ways of getting this, again, moving forward in the district. Uh, with that, I went back to the drawing board and developed a uh, presentation called um, uh, equity. Uh, it was a really interesting uh, presentation and we looked at it, shaped it to uh, pretty much say the right message because we really again wanted to give the uh, teachers an opportunity to feel comfortable having this difficult conversation. So we not only wanted the staff to have it, but the administrators, administrators to have this conversation and talk about what's happening in each and every, you know, the individual schools. So, because um, these things happen, you know, we're, we're facing circumstances with various types of diversity, equity, inclusion uh, incidents. So to talk about how did we address it and how uh, did we handle it. So a little case study. So we you know, had that conversation happening amongst the administration. And then of course, after developing this presentation, I uh, shared it with the high school staff. And uh, one elementary school uh, did share that as well. And we're going to be doing that with the other schools, the middle school and the other remaining elementary schools. So uh, this work is uh, continuing. Um, I'm proud to say that the um, members of the community, um, you guys are very supportive of us and, and we appreciate the, the just the overwhelming support that you gave and you know, giving us the space to do our job as educators. So thank you and, and we do love and care about your kids. They are wonderful people. Thank you for sharing them with us. We want to make sure we support them and hearing why we are doing this with uh, moving forward diversity and inclusion. Uh, with that, you know, I want to mention also that we have a gentleman by the name of Tony Ferriolo who uh, presented the LGBTQ+. He shared that with us last year as administration. And this year, again, we uh, had him come in and he's um, shared with us once again and we're trying to create some committees in the various schools to build that work forward, once again, to support our children, okay? Um, so, again, um, another thing I'm, we're doing is developing uh, a DEI and B mission statement. And it's currently in draft form. You guys can take a look at it at some point. Um, and, and the videos, uh, the presentations that I spoke about also, if you'd like to take a view of it, we, we can have that you know, presented to you a little later. Um, but that's uh, something that we're working on 
With our uh, diversity group here in the school, high school, um, anything that we discuss at the committee, I try to filter it down so the students and staff get a chance to see it and get us, you know, get their take and their feedback. So we're getting student voice as well as staff as well. Um, connection between people in the neighborhood, uh, not so much neighborhood, but community rather. So other districts and other communities I've been kind of reaching out to uh, folks who are doing this work and just getting information and ideas and learning about their journey. Um, learning from a, a wonderful friend now uh, from West Hartford who went through an incredible journey. The story was amazing. And um, since then, we've been just really bumping into each other and just kind of growing my group of allies. So, um, and, and then speaking of allies, you guys are wonderful too. A lot of emails have come from you guys uh, in terms of the community wanting to come out and support. And uh, right now we're just kind of trying to figure out how to utilize your skill set and the resources that's uh, available from you. So, you know, we're not ignoring you, we're just trying to figure out how to utilize that. So don't stop sending emails and don't stop being interested. Um, again, mention of the PTA. Uh, because they are housing all the schools, it was appropriate to make sure that DEI and the is connected as well, and that they too are working in this uh, journey, because you guys are the connection to the parents and the families, so it's a, a wonderful way to kind of bring that together. Um, so yeah, I mentioned the Think Equity presentation, that was a little bit, by the way. And again, that was, uh, again, the focus was to start the conversation on how to face the challenges and that hard conversation incorporating an anti-racist practice in our classrooms. Uh, next. Um, so the diversity team here at the high school consists of two staff, uh, very motivated individuals who work with these young uh, students. And they, are, uh, they get involved with adding things to the calendar as far as um, observances, you know, awareness that happens every month. Um, Weekly we have, or once a month we have an advisory, the students create videos and just initiate uh, things that they can communicate to the, to the general body at the school. Um, recently we've been working on life advice uh, to just kind of give kids just something positive to say as we kind of, not so much moving away from SEL, but we're just trying to kind of move that forward in another light. Um, and of course, uh, they also were a part of uh, bringing a uh, gentleman by the name of uh, Jeffrey Fletcher uh, from the Ruby, uh, Calvin, Ruby and Calvin Fletcher African American History Museum to present here in, in the library. It was a really amazing presentation. He brought artifacts from the museum. The students all came in and you know, it took rounds. It was a whole day event. It was amazing. Um, superintendent was there and some of the board members were there as well. So it was really a phenomenal and powerful presentation. If you ever get a chance, you can go and check it and give them a little plug. <laughs> <laughs> it's in Stratford, it's an amazing museum. Uh, future work, collaboration with uh, diversity, equi equity, inclusion, and belonging in North Haven. Um, we have a no place for, um, I'm sorry, let me do that again because I want to make sure I say this right. We're, I'm collaborating, and we are rather collaborating with the diversity, equity, include diversity, equity. Um, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. The coalition is later. That's something else. So we're doing a no hate, no place for hate with the middle school, and uh, that's um, I'm going to be joining with um, the uh, one of the middle school assistant uh, principals, Mr. Jametti, and uh, that. We're going to be doing that in the weeks to come, learning about how to kind of bring that uh, into the middle school and of course hopefully trickle it down to the elementary school. Lots going on with slurs and kids just kind of not necessarily understanding what they're saying, what they're doing with words and I want to just try to educate them. Um, once again, uh, Mr. Ferriola did that presentation. We're hoping to start some things next year with these committees that we've uh, met with. and. Uh, just to bring it into the schools again, to have support social workers, uh, uh, counselors, as well as administrators are a part of this committee as well. And joining with the North Haven Equity Coalition, that's what I meant to say, <laughs> and doing some collaborating uh, work with them. Um, plans to do more with the library and library media in terms of literature selection, and there's some humming out there about that, but um, we want to ensure that there's continuity and an appreciation for literacy. Again, it's about supporting our students and making sure that you know we move forward and what we do best as educators. And there's more to come. So uh, 
I'm wrap it up with this, my final statement. Uh, it's important that we continue the process of developing and strengthening the skills, instincts, abilities, processes, and resources that the district needs in continuously supporting our students and staff in DEI and B. And the journey is never to be forgotten. It's one of my wife's slogans. And the work must keep on. And I've seen it in my presentation. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you for allowing me to have this space. Patrick, have one, one minute. First, I'd just like to say, sure, you're doing a fantastic job with a very difficult and multi tentacle subject. I mean, it is a huge subject, and you're really doing a great job. And you know, the board appreciates. I know the students appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm sure the parents as well. Yeah. Does anybody on the board have any questions? So I, I have a question. When when you look at what you, I know you, now you're working primarily on the foundation, building coalition, things of that nature. If you look at the next, let's say, two, three years, what is, what, what do you, what's the vision for the next three years in terms of working with the students, the, the parents, administrators, what, what's the, and then also building some kind of program around our coalition, around all the uh, elementary schools and then the high school plus. Uh, the middle school. That's a great question. So again, um, right now we're trying to build capacity and really develop allyship, not just with the community, uh, but with staff, with the students. Again, the idea is to get the conversation to happen more. So uh, in the next, you know, five years down the road, maybe even two years down the road, I'd like to see students comfortable talking about race, talking about and accepting people, uh, you know, uh, folks that identify LGBTQ plus. I want to see conversations happening in classrooms that's open and people are, you know, comfortable reading material and, and having resources that they can, you know, have available to them. Um, images in, in the building that uh, shows the diverse population. You know, we are a diverse community, even though it's, it might be, you know, different percentages, we're still a diverse community. Um, I'd like to see in classrooms lessons being taught. You know, we're embracing, you know, those studies that, you know, everyone else in the world is going crazy about. But this is our country, you know, we have some positives and negatives in our history, and we have to embrace both the negative and the positive and move forward in that. My vision is, you know, that people can be loving to each other and be mindful in that way, and that's kind of the way I look at it. You know, yeah, I look at color. I'm a man of color. But I also look at people and recognize them, and I treat them with moral respect and decency, and I approach it from a point of view of love. I know people pretty much don't like to use that word love. They're afraid of it, just like they're afraid of everything else. But we need to lean into those conversations that are difficult, leading to those moments that are challenging and difficult, and treat people for who they are. Okay, be loving, be kind. So that's my passion. And my voice gets a little shaky when I talk about it because I, I'm passionate about it, you know? And uh, I want folks to just treat people as they should be, with respect. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much for adding the longing. I think that's so important here too. Um, I know Dr. Dalai regularly says, we call people in, we don't call people out. And I, I love that approach. I'm wondering, is there anything that we as a board can be doing to support you better? Do you have what you need to be successful? Um, I'm gonna get back to you on that. Okay. <laughs> but keep that Please open, do. keep that open. Okay. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, and this is a great place again, and the same thing we're doing with the administration as well as the staff and hopefully the students, and you know, it's already happening with kids, but we just need to direct how they're saying it positively, right? It'll be lovely to see that happening amongst the board too, having the hard conversation, having these difficult things. That it, my heart moved when I heard about your story. You know, thank you for sharing that. But it's, you know, why we're here to fix things so that, you know, everyone can feel comfortable and belong and know that our kids can come to school and go home safely and find their way. So, yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Brenda. No, that's okay. Um, so, I, I echo everyone. Thank you so much. I um, had the um, advantage and full transparency of working with you through the through the high school um, with my own child, but um, I'm also thinking about with you know we have the the diversity club for the high school, and you know it's growing in the middle school, and I also understand the limited resources. I'm fully aware, um, 
But I also understand that these conversations are happening now in the elementary school, and I think that's a big opportunity. So before we even get to middle school, before we get to high school, to frame the discussion, to frame um, how our babies interact with each other and, and move through the world and, and have their own sense of belonging. I, I appreciate the work that you're doing with the staff. Um, I, I will admit my, my child came home and said he was an upstander. I had to look it up because I didn't know what it was, but I found it was a word that he's used in the school based, based on conversations with you. So is there an opportunity to, and I understand the steering committee is in place, to frame, you know, to have a, a small parent committee, to have a small student council. I don't think we have to wait two years to, to have those conversations in school with the kids, that they're already having the conversations. Um, but I think, I, I don't believe in boiling the ocean, but I do believe in taking incremental steps. So even if we just have that place and space for these kids, the parents, the, the you know, to, to come together and provide support to you. So whatever your mission is, to provide that additional support um, in terms of making the vision come to come to life. So I'd love yes, to support. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know if there's a question there. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to say that that's one of the reasons why we're you know teaming up with the PTA Association to create an opportunity for you know parents to you know discuss the diversity, equity, inclusion in the elementary schools, mm -hmm. middle schools, and high schools. So we're, we're working on it. Okay. Yes. And for the elementary schools. Yes. For the students as well. Okay. Awesome. Yes. Hi. You mentioned we could have access to some of the um, the trainings or the, the kind of speakers that came in. Is there a, like a site that we can go to to kind of see that? Or? So Patrick created his PowerPoint. I'll share that. With you. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll include some of the site, the websites of some of the speakers and trainers we have. Great. Thank you. Patrick, thank you again. I'm sorry. Thank, thank you. Tony you. Thank you. I'd like to go through the uh, consent agenda. Uh, one, the resignation of Karen Castagnola, varsity softball head coach, North Haven High School. Resignation of Andrea Samperi, special education paraprofessional at Clintonville School and the retirement of Joanne Callahan, 2-3 ID teacher of uh, Green Acres School. I have a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. Discussion? All in favor? Um, so moved. Can I just real quick just no say course. thank you to all the teachers who are leaving. It, like, their impact has been felt and we appreciate their service. That we do. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, now I need to have a uh, motion to approve the reduction in the 2023 2024 Board of Education budget, which was the $250,000 uh, reduction. Um, I'm looking for a second on that. Second. Can we have a discussion about it. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so we saw the line items that we're proposing to reduce. Um, I have concerns, and I just want to kind of poke at this a little bit to see. It, it's lovely that we're saying that we're not going to impact classrooms. That's, like, very important. But when we're reducing contingency line items for things like special education tuition by, is it $125,000? I'm very concerned about that. Um, because that doesn't leave us with much. And like, I want to just kind of understand, like, one, where does our special education continu contingency, uh, where special ed fund, like reserve fund, stand now? Where do we think it's going to stand at the end of the year? And then if we do have students who move into town and require our placement, um, I want to make sure that we're able to provide them with the placement that they need and the services that they deserve. So can we just, can you just, Tell me a little bit more about that. Okay, so this first question, $178,000 for the uh, mm -hmm. is where the SPED fund, special education fund stands now. Um, for Jack Dean, with the expenses going on that are happening, um, the legal expenses, probably about $40,000 at the end of the year. 
give or take. I mean, I, I, again, I don't know the hours and the experience. I'm just going based on what the trend has been. Um, so it's probably about $40,000. Um, to give you an idea also, we probably will be able to increase that a little bit because of the fact that we are, we do build New Haven, I just want to bring this out. Um, we do build New Haven um, through the Open Choice Program for all the special ed services that there's students who come here. There's 51 students from New Haven who do a lot of our schools. Um, and so utilize the schools through the Open Choice Program and get special ed services that cost that coming to the total of about $225,000 a year. We actually build a, we get $3,000 per student to, um, that reduces that cost, but so that's, that cost is only reduced by $3,000, but at the end of the day, that leaves us at about $185,000 that we have to build back to New Haven, give or take, um, and we are only getting about 10% of that from New Haven. So why, what I'm, what I'm saying about this is that, the, why I brought this up is because we will be able to get some of that money back, so that 40,000 may go to be about 60,000, right? So that's, but I just want to give you a full picture. So about $60,000 is what we'll have at the end of the year. The, uh, the contingency that I have put in the budget is about $425,000, assuming about four students to the take. I don't know the number, it's, it's you pick a number, and that, that could, could be anything like that too. Um, taking $125,000 out leaves us $300,000 in that contingency fund. We've already budgeted for all the students that are in there, right? So they're, they're, they're all covered, so we have about $300,000 in contingency for potentially new students coming in. So here's where I like get a little bit worried, right? So that's a volatile line item, like gas and electric, other volatile line items in there. I wanna just kinda understand what your recommended like base level of comfort is in the mix between the contingency and the reserve fund. Because I think we're running a little lean, <laughs> like for my taste, and I want to just make sure that we're having this discussion and, and talking about it. Like I think that it makes sense for us to have more than a combined total of three hundred and sixty maybe thousand um, dollars, because that could be two students. I mean, we we don't know what we don't know. I don't want students and families to feel like they can't move here because they're going to be under a microscope. Um, they deserve. An education and they deserve for us to know what's happening and for us to prepare so that's one line item cut that I'm not super comfortable with um, the gas and electric were two and three that I'm not super comfortable with I understand that those are the contingencies too but those line items are very volatile there are I don't want to get political but there are like other factors that are going to impact the price of heating and, and gas as we move forward so can you talk a little bit about what the contingencies for gas and electric look like after those $25,000? Or was it $25,000? Yeah, it's, 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 that cut their contingency is about half. Yeah. There's about $50,000 to pay them in each one of those. So it's about half of what they were going to have. So there's about $25,000 each still left there. Um, I have seen, just looking at the bills, the trend has been stabilized. It has stabilized a little bit. It going up sharply and then it stabilized the plateau a little bit now. And so I'm hoping it stays, again, it's hoping. Again, because I, I don't honestly, no one knows where it's going. We all are doing something else. My crystal ball is broken too. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. that's 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 part of the problem with that. So um, it, it's to say, are you comfortable? With, am I comfortable with the twenty-five thousand? No, that's why I had fifty thousand there. Like, am I comfortable with three hundred thousand? No, that's why I had four hundred twenty-five thousand there. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I would want to reassure you that we will find the money if we have to for those students. So there is no, there's no doubt. That. Like, let's talk about like where would that money, like let's go one layer deeper. Let's pretend sure. that, that worst case scenario, well not worst case scenario, but, but that these several factors converge and that we have additional students who need tuition money and that gas and electric have increased. Like where do we go next from there? So um, if you'll see, like I prepared the, I, um, so my report I actually gave you a, 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 my early budget, what I where I think this year is going to end up, you'll see that in the, the, the salary line, we do have some extra money there, that's where it ends up coming in. And that's generally, I've been watching that over the last three years, you generally see that happen there, because you see more teachers retired, and then we hire teachers at a lower rate, and so we can pick up a couple hundred thousand dollars there in any given year. So I, I do, it's not a given, it's not a guarantee. We can have no one to well, we don't, so people retire this year, we can have very few retire this year, and therefore we don't pick that up the same amount of money up. Yeah, very, and it's very low. I mean, it's fifty thousand dollars, twenty-five thousand dollars. I don't, but there's always seems to be money coming in at those line items, right? So, I do think there is going to be money there. I can't guarantee there's going to be money there, but 
the trend is looking like that. But again, the first two years of my tenure here, it's been through a pandemic, so I don't think those are normal years either. So again, it's it's this year seems to be more, more normal year, and I think that's what we're seeing. And he's going to put a little damper on. We are in a teacher shortage right now, right? and so we are not as fortunate as we were in past years of hiring uh, new teachers out. We have areas, whether it's math, science, <coughs> there's a shortage where we need to have a good quality person in that uh, classroom. And that person may be at a set 13 or 14 that is going to be no different than the person that just retired. So it may be a wash at some point. Well, that's sort of what I'm thinking too, because I want to make sure that we're not, our new teachers have been phenomenal, but we have more tenured teachers who are brilliant. And, and I want to be able to keep them and retain them and the tremendous value that they bring. And I want to make sure that for some of, some of those more specialized positions that we're not having to sacrifice value in order to meet budgetary requirements. And we never do. And that's the message that I share with the administrators um, when hiring season opens, uh, that you hire the best person to put in that classroom regardless. Uh, we'll have conversations about it, of course. We'll have, um, you know, sometimes principals are like, well, I have two great candidates. Let's I talk it through, whatever it may be. But um, they, the budget doesn't enter their minds during that process. It's who can be put in the classroom. And, and one of the things also that was considered, we could have made a hard cut, which was the three teachers in the yeah. Three teachers and, and a intervention. An intervention is that would have been 250000 And we could have kept all the other contingencies where we were more comfortable. In our conversations, we felt more comfortable having that and worrying about the contingencies later. And, and that was really, we were where everything was at at the time when we had to find the extra quarter of a million. So I, so I just wanted to share that. And I, and I, know, I know you support having more teachers online. I just want to make sure that everybody's aware that, you know, that hard cut would have been easy because that's money right there and everything else would have been the same. So, you know, everybody knows budgets are, are a guessing game and it is so difficult. And I give Patrick and Howard all the credit for, for diving in so deep and allowing me in some of these conversations where, you know, we've had disagreements about how to how to do things and you know in the end we're always looking what's best for the, the children like every every decision that we all make so it, it's difficult it was very difficult and then we came up with um, what we have today and I just want to explain how we kind of got there and what our other real option was that we refused to take and would not take that I, I fully agree with that and I I want to protect teachers and the positions that we have because they are incredibly valuable. But I think some folks have heard like, oh, they're going to cut contingencies. They didn't maybe need that money right away, but that's something that I disagree with and would want to just make sure that we're articulating publicly yep. because although there are contingencies mm -hmm. that we're budgeting for, these particular ones, which are, which are logical to cut, make me nervous and that that nervousness comes from the fact that I, I don't have faith that <laughs> the gas prices and electric prices will stay where they are. And um, we also were looking at the bus company too, right? We're looking yes. at 50,000? 50,000? Yes, 50,000 50, uh, bus company. Have we, have we heard anything from them on that? Yes, I've heard back from them and he is getting me an action plan. So. Okay, good. And, I, and Howard, please correct me if I'm wrong, but we do have to live in this budget when we get there to find out where we can, it's hard to predict where we will be able to find additional funds in case we need them. We have, yeah. to, be, we have to live in it, and maybe the gas does come down. Maybe there's certain areas while we're living in it. I think, you know, Howard's been masterful at, at looking at trends over time. So as opposed to just, you know, we're going to guess we need 125 in the tuition. Well, let's see how it looked over the past few years and what we needed so we can plan appropriately. So it's more of an educated guess than a dark board kind of approach. You know, it's, so, uh, again, I have to commend them because they did a tremendous job, and it was um, tenuous sometimes at best, but it worked out, I think, um, as well as it could. Thank goodness it wasn't $400,000, you know, that's, <laughs> Or 251. Or, or 251, exactly, <laughs> or 251. That's exactly correct. Does anybody have any other questions about any other comments? All right, can I get a second, please? 
Second. We did already. Can I? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so move. Thank you. Let's move on to the reports of the standing committees. Uh, Marty, you got ACES? Um, ACES right now is uh, trying to get to the end of the year with most of their stuff. Um, they've been looking at staffing, and as we uh, do, they, they were in a position where they had to notify a number of, of their staff that they were being let go. Uh, most of them that are being rehired come August, the way their budget is set up. So, uh, they're also expanding a couple of their programs, and I don't have much information on those at the moment. Curriculum uh, instruction and planning? <coughs> Do you want to speak on that uh, photography class trip at all? Um, no, but it was in your proposal. It didn't go to CNI because we didn't have the meeting, so I asked Joyce to put it in the full board um, packet because they want to go soon and we will be able to get it through if we waited for the next CNI meeting. So it's a high school trip to New York City, and it's the photography classes. Uh, Wendy Wade is the teacher, Diana Blythe, um, our art coordinator, and parent will go on this um, trip as chaperones. And right now, there's about 15 students interested in going. Okay. May I have a motion to? Ron, you want yeah, to may I have a motion? To approve the trip? Excuse me? Do you want a motion to approve the trip? Yeah, I want a motion to approve the North Haven High School photography class trip to New York City on May 1st, 2023. I'll, make, I'll approve the motion. I'll second. Do you have any discussion? Again, just thank you for this opportunity. This is a great opportunity for the kids. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Education public? Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend the meeting last week, but I did talk to Mr. Pellegrino, the chairman, and he just asked that I share that the comedy night for um, the Ed Foundation is coming up on April 28th. It is at the uh, Knights of Columbus Lodge over in Hamden there. So I have the flyer here if anyone's interested. The flyers have been going home to schools, and I think they're posted on some of the uh, some of the front doors of the schools as well. So it should be a fun night for everyone. Uh, let's go over some policy about the second read of the following policies. Policy 5141.20 with administration of student medications in the schools. Policy 5141.25 management plan and guidelines for students with food allergies, glycogen storage disease, and or diabetes. Policy 5145.4, non-discrimination. Policy 5145.8A, policy regarding students in Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. Series 4000, personnel policy. Emergency Action Plan for Interscholastic and Intramural Athletic Events. Series 4000 Personnel Policy, Extortional Heat Illness Awareness for Intramural and Interscholastic Athletics. So we can all have that prepared for our uh, next month. I appreciate that. We go to the Superintendent's Report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just had a short report tonight. I did have some um, items to share around initially around MNJ bus company, but we had a lengthy, lengthy discussion around that. And Ms. Bugliano, thank you so much uh, for coming to speak today. And um, it's unfortunate I've gotten to know you so well through this situation. Um, just want to share a little bit on our senior graduation. Uh, it is scheduled for Thursday, June 15th. Uh, it will begin at 4 o'clock. And it will, again, be held behind the turf fields like it was last year. Uh, Dr. Dow, I received really great feedback. Uh, I think folks like the backdrop of the turf field and the fields, and it also helps pre preserve our new track. We do not want trucks and equipment being lugged over the track to get to the field there, so I, I think it serves two good purposes. Uh, so again, there's June 15th at 4 o'clock. That's actually the end of my report today. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I guess it was good today. <laughs> Assistant Superintendent's report. Okay. Um, this evening, instead of slides, I have left you a brochure, which is actually a smaller version of this board that's up here. Um, and those materials were shared a few weeks ago at the Connecticut Association.
Association of Public School Superintendents Conference. Our summer programs have been recognized by this group and honored as an exemplary program. So as part of this distinction, um, we were invited to come and present and share our work. So Mary Lynn Tantorski, one of the coordinators, and myself went, and we highlighted our programs for other districts. Um, I know I've spoken about this in the past, but we've had very robust programs, especially um, since COVID. We've grown them having um, intervention, enrichment opportunities, and they, they range from kindergarten through grade 12. And we also have um, credit redemption opportunities for high school students who need to make up those credits so that it puts them on track for graduation. And annually, there's an extended year program for eligible special education students. So again, this year, we are offering all of these um, items. And we're actually adding a, um, a pilot for incoming kindergarten students who could maybe use a little bit of readiness. And um, bringing STEM and elementary science into our programs because it's been such a buzz during the school year. So we thought this would really keep the motivation going. Information will be um, forthcoming um, in newsletters so parents can keep an eye out um, and teachers will be reaching out um, for students that may benefit to encourage families to participate. And it really has just become like its own school. We have SROs, we have nurses. Um, last year we had over 400 students participating. So it's really a wonderful opportunity. I can't thank our um, teachers who participate because they really give up a lot to um, come in the summer to do that. Um, so we're so grateful to them. Our directors, Mary Lynn Tiantorski, um, Jody Wilcox, Anthony Mastriano, and Tracy Gambardella are just dynamite. So um, it's a lot to celebrate, and it's wonderful. Yes. Um, so the representative from CAPS, the Connecticut Association of Public School Superintendents, was legitimately harassing me to make sure that we were represented at their showcase. Because from what I gather, the program that's been created here, mainly by Melinda, has has been become the model for the state because we're not only supporting our learners who need to close that gap, we're hitting the uh, enrichment end of it as well. So we're hitting all fronts at all grades and the turnout of 400 students is, is truly amazing. And it's, it's, it's a one of a kind program from around the state from what I'm gathering. People are calling us about that, so. And we're really fortunate because we don't offer transportation. You know, we can't budget that in. There's transportation for the special education sides of the programs, but really parents are so gracious in terms of um, bringing their students, and our directors try to work really hard to um, be flexible in terms of time and um, pick up and drop off. And we really truly run it like a school. You, you know, you're in line, and there's signs, and drop off, and pick up. And um, last summer, that representative from CAPS, I think, visited us three different times. Um, and you know, we were written up in a state program book that I know Patrick had shared the article earlier in the year, and um, it's really something that the district should be proud of. Can I just say one thing? I, I agree with you completely, and everybody that participates, and all the teachers and staff, but I think you're being too humble. Like, I've never heard anything but a phenomenal response to anybody that's participated in this program and all the work and time and effort that you've put into it Melinda you're you're very kind to share the praise with everyone else but and as you said the district is benefiting it and we're being recognized from it and in large part that's due to your hard work so thank, thank you. you very much uh, and just one little plug we are going to try to um, budget next year so that we're able to keep this robust program going so that would be an ongoing conversation. <laughs> Director of Student Services Report. Sure. Um, the State Department of Education offered all directors across the state the opportunity to apply for a grant called CT Said Stipend. Um, the grant was approved for North Haven, and each special education teacher and related service staff member who complete individualized educational plans um, will receive a stipend of $250. Each staff member mentioned will receive the stipend once the funds are released from the state. Um, and I appreciate all the hard work the staff has done to learn and navigate the new platform this year. Okay, thank you very much. 
Director of Finance Operations and Human Resources. Thank you. Um, as the report, as my report showed, spending continues to trend in line with last year. However, I did want to bring up uh, a few other items where we're seeing an uptick in the need for overtime, shift differential, and substitute costs. Um, and I, I just want to bring that up because we talked about where I provided the, uh, the projected where, where our budget would end the year, and you'll notice in the substitute certified substitutes and the uh, uh, non-certified substitutes are both in negative balance category. Um, just wanted to give you a little bit of statistics behind that. This year, as of this year, we have, it's the first year we started tracking the detail for FMLA, um, and we had 49 requests for FMLA leave this year. Um, anytime you, t and I believe it was 15 of those were pregnancy FMLA leaves. So anytime you're doing that, you're, you're double paying, right? You're paying the the person, because they have the sick time to utilize for six, eight, well, in the case of pregnancy, it's gonna be eight or 10 weeks or other people who go out and you're paying them, and then you have to pay someone to do their job. So when I budget, I budget it for 15 long-term subs. I have 15 people already out, I'm just on pregnancy, and then on top of that, you have all you have the other additional people who are out because of that. So that is why you're seeing this trend this year being higher. Um, I am going to be tracking it going forward now that this year, first year I'm tracking the FMA more diligently, trying to see exactly what the trend is so that going forward we can make a more educated budget going up regarding substitutes and the need for those and what that budget would be. But I just want to give you that, that little technical behind the scenes background on why we're seeing such a, why we're going to see a negative balance in those, those line items. Can I just add that, for those who don't know, FMLA is Family exactly. Medical Leave Act. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just in case anyone doesn't. If all employees are entitled to 60 days, or in this case in the education field, it's 12 weeks of uh, Family Medical Leave Act. It's unpaid, but the federal law allows the district to allow them to utilize their approved sick time. And the way food sick time works is they can accumulate it up to, it depends upon their contract, but it's like in many cases up to 185 days. So um, what will happen is they can utilize all of that time to be paid over 60 days, and at the same time we're paying a substitute. In the case of long-term substitutes, it goes from between $140 that we budget per day after day 40. When it becomes day 41, they get paid the $245 a day. So all of a sudden your cost doubles almost. So it becomes, a, it, it's when you start to see a lot of this happen, um, you, you, that's where your budget gets out of whack. But again, that's an unknown, it's a variable. To your point, it's you, how, do, how do I know who's gonna take FMLA next year? But I, I think we, what we can do is we can try and trend it and see exactly where, where we, we uh, line the trend and try and make our best estimate. Uh, do you uh, monitor our uh, population of teachers? So when we were discussing before, we're starting to see teachers there's a portion of teachers retiring, and our budget saving is we're hiring younger teachers at a lesser rate, but younger teachers will be starting families. And so when you do your predictions, when you're looking at these trends, are you bringing that into consideration what the percentage of teachers under the age of 40, let's say, or how it has shifted so that you can plan appropriately for next year? I haven't got there yet, but that's okay. hopefully where I will get there. I, the first step was to start tracking, all right, how many FLA people, how many people go out on FMLA every year? Mm -hmm. had, had that. Again, the last first two years was a pandemic. Not a lot of people were going out on FMLA because there wasn't a lot of people like, sure. and yeah. stuff like that. So, um, but now we've seen, and again, there was a trend, I guess, there was a lot of pregnancies that came out of the pandemic. So again, we're seeing that. That's a trend. Is that, the, is that going to be the trend going forward? Who knows? Um, but again, yes, I, I do want to get to that level of technical expertise, so to speak, or tracking trends so that we can see, yeah, our age, the age of our of teachers is this. They're more females, right? So therefore, the trend is going to have more, 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 more likely to start families. Males also take that. Yes, awesome. but the way they, they can take FMLA, but they only get two weeks. Right, because of the way, the way it works is two weeks of leave. They get 10 days of family leave, so they don't get the full eight to 12, 10 day, eight to 10 weeks that a female gets for recovery from the pregnancy. So that's the way When we did next year, the, the, the budget that just got reduced by 200 days, did we account for an increase, the, the increase that we're seeing currently in FMLA usage? No, we did not. So Howard, I know this is the right question for you or Patrick. You had mentioned teacher shortage. Is that in relation to the FMLA request or is it just generally what you're no, seeing? It's just generally what we're seeing. Okay, is that for this uh, academic year or looking towards the fall? Um, it, 
the shortage itself. Yeah. It's a nationwide teacher shortage that um, has been impactful actually starting last year. We have seen um, our elementary candidates in some positions. When I was in L at Ridge Road, we had 300 plus candidates for one position. Uh, we're down to you know, 80, 90, sometimes even lower for elementary positions. So it's a sharp decrease. And then you look at the areas of shortage where we could end up with under 10 for some for some of these teachers. You mean, so when you say 80 and 10, you're talking about applicants for the Applicants, yes, I'm sorry. Okay, and these are qualified applicants? Correct. Okay, so the application is, even though it's lower, it's there? Yep. Okay, okay, but we don't have a teacher shortage per se. We do not have a teacher shortage right now. No. Okay, all right, because when you said I was like, okay, yeah. we, okay, all right. But I'm just talking about applicants, thank you for that. Okay, yeah, yeah. thanks yeah. for clarifying. No, I didn't mean to give you a heart attack. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was my question. Okay. Um, you just as we, um, Marie mentioned in terms of, um, you know, going out for maternity, um, Emotional well-being as well um, with FMLA, you know, just something to think about tracking there as well from an from an FMLA perspective. We're seeing that in the industry right now. So no, I think there's a lot of statistics there that we can utilize, and, and the reasons for going on FMLA. Again, it's, it's a tricky thing because we have to keep it. That's it's yeah, all confidential, exactly. right? So exactly. I have to, so I have to Absolutely. keep names out of it and do. Yeah. But I yeah. think it's something I do want to do because again, that's the only way you're going to get to a better number is to be able to understand root cause of why, these, why someone's going out or how many are going out and trend tracking that way. I know insur insurance <coughs> industry does it a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. They do it for our risk assessments and they, they give us all the kind of the actuarial information. So I think that's something we can utilize. We can utilize uh, the, data. The, the data. Go, go to our actuaries from our medical. Mm -hmm. and say, okay, what, here's, you know our population. What, how, give us some data behind that that you can actually show, give us, predict, right? Because that's what they do. That's their job is to predict that. And we're self-insured. We are self-insured, but it's through Anthem, so mm -hmm. it's through Anthem, so it's through Cross Blue Shield, and that's just been re-upped um, this year, so that we'll be with them next, in the next few years, I guess it is, three years, since the way the program works. So I think we can utilize that, because again, they have all the data, and they have all the people there, so we can utilize them to get that information. We use Brian Brown as our broker, so they, and they're very good at doing the statistical analysis that we just don't have the, the, the bandwidth, right? myself or my staff mm -hmm. to be able to do. But again, we have the resources that we go out there, we're paying paying them a lot of money. They, they do have the resources for you. So, yeah, exactly. Exactly. so I think that's where we're headed. I just haven't got there yet. So it's, we will, hopefully in the next year or two. We'll get there. Awesome. Thanks. OK, so I'll continue on. Um, again, I talked about the very preliminary estimate of where the operating budget will end the year. Um, but again, as I said, this is very preliminary. As we still have part of April and all of May to see what the expenditures will go, combined with the unknown of the final numbers on the excess cost grant from the state. Um, and that being said, at this point in time, we're estimating there will be a $200,000 balance under unutilized funds, considering, um, but considering the town does not fund the Board of Ed capital projects, this amount stands, it will be our recommendation to, the, to you that that is where we put the funds so that we can pay for those that, that we talked about, that immediate, that immediate need, which is about $175,000 so I would recommend that to the board. But again, we have to see where the number comes in. Um, the monthly transfer report was provided in your package. I'm just going to ask some questions. Okay. Um, Non-operating items. Uh, cafeteria fund, we have received quotes for new walk-in freezers and coolers from Montaweez Elementary, Clintonville Elementary, and Ridge Road Elementary. The cost to replace all three of those will be about $78,000, and that will all be paid out of the cafeteria funds, which are now, we are now, again, back in the um, mode of free lunches for everyone. And so that's that fund will be increasing again as opposed to increasing as it was initially. Um, capital projects, although my written report stated nothing new to report since this was written, the slide at Ridge Road has been that was broken and unusable has been replaced since my since I wrote that before. Um, we also want uh, the final item I had from other non-operating items is the Giles Avenue package. The additional space proposal, the facilities department has received a proposal from the current landlord of the Giles Avenue facility for an additional 1,500 square feet of space adjacent to the current space and provide an extended lease. Um, and I just wanted to present that to you. Yeah, I'm going to actually table that. I'm going to table, to table it. Okay. Um, uh, medical reserve numbers to. Uh, Medical reserve, uh, $2,639,447 is the current reserve balance at the end of uh, March. It's 117% of the year, um, year point required by the actuaries. 
Workers' compensation is $667,756. SPED is the $178,650 I talked about. Um, capital projects are currently 90427 but with the, not, the projects that are still open, it's uh, $15,721. And then the excess cost grant, which I don't have the final number for, I just received the actual percentage. Um, if you recall, I, told, I mentioned the law that had been changed to be instead of 70 percent was 85 percent. But I also found out that the appropriation, depending, that's all dependent upon the appropriation from the state. And so the actual percentage that we're getting is 73.3 percent. That's not 85 percent. So it's only 3.3 percent higher than the 70 percent. And so it's not a whole lot more than what we project. Any other questions? <coughs> I have a question. Sorry, no. too late. Um, so no, this no, doesn't. You no, said no, you no, said no. trends. So I'm just. I just have a question, and I know it's a lot of information. But a couple of board meetings ago, um, you guys were chatting about getting trends for how the schools are going to grow, and I know it's a lot of info. Do we have any um, inclination on when? have that information on the growth of the school district? So I think it come, the NESDAQ comes out quarterly, so I'm hoping it comes out soon. And we're also looking, I think it's called SLAN. That was, oh, yeah. So that's the other one that was recommended to us by uh, Colliers. We haven't reached out to them yet, but that would be our secondary one. And those are supposed to be um, important to them, more readily available to us with uh, more school-friendly information, more actionable things that we can talk about. So coming soon. I have a motion to approve the monthly financial report, including the recommended transfers. So moved. Take it a second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. All right, I was gonna make, I was gonna do, uh, try to get approval for the additional maintenance garage. There's some information that's out there that, that I wanna exhaust before I present it, because I know there's gonna be questions asked about it, and I wanna make sure that we have, uh, I have those answers for you or I even ask you to consider it. So I would like to have uh, a motion to table the discussion on the uh, additional rental space at the maintenance garage on Giles Avenue. Move to table. Can I get a second? Second. Is there any discussion about it? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, so move. Okay, we're gonna move on to public comment. Uh, public comment now will be reserved for any agenda item. You step off and Name and address and it's all yours. Okay. Um, my name is Jamie Chris Marzik and I live at 73 Lexington Gardens. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, the administration and the board um, specifically for today and bringing Mr. Lawrence um, to talk and give that presentation about the DEIB work that he's doing um, across the district. Um, I think that this is probably the most critical and important work we're doing for our students in schools. I'm so happy he's here. I'm so happy he's engaged with the community, with the PTA. Um, I'll speak for myself only, but I think that a lot of people would echo that we want more. You know, we as parents want more. We want to engage with our kids. We want to know how to support them in this learning and education. Um, we talked about training the board members obviously training faculty and staff. I think parents as well want these trainings, and I know that that's cost prohibitive probably from a, a lot of standpoints, um, but I think bringing in speakers for parents about this work is really critical. Um, I'm gonna second what Ms. Thais Moore spoke about at the elementary school level. I don't think we can limit ourselves to middle school and, and um, high school diversity clubs. I think they should absolutely exist at the elementary school level. Um, additionally, I think um, something I want to call out that Green Acres did, or call in, uh, the one school, one book, you know, and how that developmentally is so appropriate to talk about inclusion, empathy, loving kindness, things that, you know, Mr. Lawrence talked about and are so appropriate at the younger levels. We could be doing that work um, for our K through five, absolutely, and building the culture that we certainly want at the middle and high school level. Um, Mr. Lawrence also talked about literacy and how literacy is so critical um, to, to understanding, you know, students' perspectives, a mirror and a window. We've used that language a lot. 
I was recently made aware about, at the middle school level, um, language arts teachers having to block off their books for fear of um, books being vetted or being challenged by parents. And again, I just want to speak for myself only that um, I want my kids to have access to all reading material. All books, um, if people don't want to read a certain book, I think they should have that choice, but it should not be at the discretion of an entire district or a classroom to remove um, literature from the classrooms. Um, and again, I think this can be done in a developmentally appropriate way. I think that there's way to talk about anti-racism work, you know, as Mr. Lawrence is saying, LGBTQ plus students, gender identity, these issues, these conversations are not too mature uh, for our younger grades. So I just I want to echo what Ms. Tice Moore said about bringing that work to the elementary school. I'm so happy that we have Mr. Lawrence here doing that work in our district. So thank you so much. First, I'd like to thank you for bringing Mr. Lawrence here. Um, can, I you have, can you please state your Mary, name? Yeah, sorry, Mariana. My name is Mariana Nibromatos. I live on Two Bar Bar Road Circle. Thank you. So this is my first year here in Arkhaven, and I've been very happy with the schools, and I want to you know, acknowledge all the work that you do and the work that my, my kids go to Ridge Road, and I appreciate a lot what the teachers there do. And Sorry. Uh, so my kids, um, we came here 10 years ago, we are Brazilians, both my, my husband and I, and I'd like to hear, thank you, what has, what is being done, like to recognize in terms, since we're talking about the next, next school year and the dates that we observe, and the things that are important. I see around a lot of towns what they do when they celebrate the Hispanic and Latin Heritage Month. Um, I've been seeing that we have like around 10% of our students that recognize themselves as, you know, Latin and Hispanic. And um, I think it is a topic that is very important and has to be brought at all levels, elementary schools included. Um, my kids are very proud of their culture. Um, my son came home with a letter written in Portuguese this week that he wrote because his teacher gave him the opportunity to write because my mom recently passed away and he really wanted... So... I just want to say that I want to hear what we're thinking about how to recognize those people. Because my husband and I, we're bringing Brazilian people to this town because we believe in this town. Uh, we have four new stu Brazilian students just this year. So I think this 10% is like from maybe two years ago. And I want to see the, these kids proud of their cultures, not only you know all the Latins, like all cultures that we can, um, recognize, we can celebrate the dates that all the different people uh, celebrate. So, I, sorry I'm very emotional today, but I left my kids at home in a very special moment for me, so I could speak up. So I, I wasn't going to sit, I talked to some people here around before, but I'm not a person who likes to, you know, speak a lot in public except for my work. Um, but I think it's, it, you know, it's something really important. Like I worked with education in Brazil before I came here for my, spo for my postdoc. And we were really like, why we're doing hands-on science course at like, you know, college level, we are going to the communities with people who grew up in their communities that end up going to Harvard so they could see themselves and recognize themselves and people who are successful there. And um, I just, wanna you know again thank you so much and thank you for the teachers who recognize those students and who let them you know um, show what they know and be proud of who they are 
and I just want to move forward that we have more of these discussions of the different people and, dif and appreciate you know, all the diversity that the town has. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else would like to speak? Hi, uh, Tim Gabriel, Renee Lane. Um, and I also wanted to echo the support for the, the DEI. And sorry, Mr. Lawrence had to leave because I wanted to um, kind of tell him to his face. Uh, it's great to finally hear that work. Um, we've been looking forward to hearing about some of the great stuff that he's been doing for a while. Um, and I'd love to be able to dig into it. I especially loved him uh, sort of describing his passion um, for why he does this. And I, I definitely share that as well. Um, to me, it's vital that this work sort of continues um, and expands. Uh, it's an urgent need, and I want to highlight a couple of um, examples, um, not to sort of veer things in a negative direction, but just to show that this is kind of an ongoing issue. There was a article, um, probably about a month or a month or two ago, um, that had described a transgender student of color who was in the North Haven schools, um, who had unfortunately uh, left and kind of left because of sort of not feeling welcome, saying that they had kind of uh, been thought of as an outcast and was not really accepted into any of the spaces that they were going into. Um, this was otherwise like a model student who was, um, you know, had started, uh, had apparently worked on starting the diversity club at the middle school, which would share in, in common with my daughter, who's also trying to do that now uh, as well, and was just kind of made to not feel welcome. Um, another example is, you know, a couple of weeks ago, there was a, this, these are all from the middle school, was sent out, um, there was an email that was sent out. It was just like the morning announcements, um, but in those announcements, there was a quote, and it seemed like an innocuous quote if it, you didn't read who it was from, but it was from Robert E. Lee. Um, and just having everybody sort of be on the same page of like recognizing who Robert E. Lee is and like, being able to know that that's not a person that we should be, you know, trying to take advice from, um, I think is kind of a vital part of like why we are providing an education to everybody um, in the district. Um, and then the other thing is just, you know, I mentioned that my daughter is starting the diversity club. There's been kind of a slow process of getting that going. Uh, she had kind of came forward with this initiative in the fall, and they still haven't had their first meeting yet. Um, and there's a number of reasons why that's happening, um, but. I would think you know the the impact that some of these kind of like structural things can have on students. If my daughter had not been sort of you know been encouraged in the background by by me and my wife to continue going with this, I think she probably would have just gave up on it at some point and just been like, okay, well I guess we're not going to have a diversity club at the middle school. Um, so I want to just you know sort of highlight those things about like why it's important that we do this work and why we continue to do it. Um, I also, you know, was a little um, surprised by hearing about, I had heard about the, um, the issues with the books as well, too. Um, I didn't want to, like, go too much into it, but I did want to, like, give you guys, if you wanted to, like, the chance to elaborate on what actually the situation was, because I'm hearing a lot of stuff secondhand, and I'm not exactly sure what happened either. So, um, but I, I, of course, do not, you know, support like parents being able to decide what's taught in the curriculum. We've been over this a couple times in the past. Um, you know, I didn't move here to, to send my kids to PragerU. I moved here so that educators can educate them. Um, this is not a burger joint. It's not something where you can customize your, your menu of, of what education you get. Students should be getting the education that our education, educators feel is, is appropriate for them. So. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gabriel. So, just to elaborate on what you had requested, the um, currently the the books at the middle school are going up through an inventory. We want to make certain we know what is getting into kids' hands. Um, and this is not talking curriculum books. This is talking independent reading books. Our curriculum is set. It is. Um, it's actually being revamped at the middle school currently, but we're gonna. The, some of the questions that are out there has only to do with the classroom libraries and the independent reading books of this. I just wanted to make that delineation between the two. Um, but we're going through an inventory to make certain that we know what's inside those classroom libraries. So when they're getting in the kids' hands, 
we know what literature they're looking at. And a lot of classroom libraries are, you know, uh, we're coming to find that some of the material in there might not be developmentally appropriate. Doesn't mean that it doesn't belong in some students' hands, it just might not belong in a sixth grade student's hand, it might belong in a 10th grade student's hand. So we want to make sure that we are solid on what we're offering students so it's developmentally appropriate. It doesn't mean it's going away, it just might be at a different grade level where it's appropriately um, placed. In classroom libraries, they are sometimes a hodgepodge of materials that teachers <coughs> have inherited from teachers before them, um, from tax sales, from parent donations. So Their own collection. Right, their own collection. So the, the conversations that we've had with um, teachers at the middle school is really the books are fine on your library as long as you know what those books are and you have read them. That, you know, if it's a sixth grade classroom, you don't have um, maybe an adult book that was picked up at a tag sale that's now on your shelf. So that's the inventory process of that. And some of it came from opening a book and seeing it was stamped North Haven High School. Okay, well, that just means it left the curriculum and ended up at the middle school. We need, that's not okay. It might be okay, we just need to make sure it's okay before it's. Uh, yeah, before it sits there in that library. Can I ask a quick question about this? Because I don't know. Like, who decides what's developmentally appropriate? It's professionals, right? Professionals, right. And we are, we are doing an inventory that's strictly focused on developmental appropriateness. It's not about anything else. Thank you for that. And Tracy Gambardella is our K through eight <coughs> professional for um, our ELA coordinator and uh, Debbie Manning is 9 through 12, and, and they are um, the experts in our district around literature and English literature. So we, um, we rely heavily on them, and they are well educated in that field. They're reading away. <laughs> yes, they are reading away. And you know, this, this, just for full transparency, opened up conversation around um, digital books that we have as well. So at the particularly 6 through 12 level, we have um, an app that's called Sora that um, houses a whole bunch of, of books that we buy licenses for. So um, our technology department was very helpful during the pandemic in terms of populating um, those devices with lots and lots of books. So I too have been reading away and um, took a tablet with me over spring break because I went to library all these books. And um, as I was reading them, I thought to myself, I can see everything on the SOAR app. Can everybody else see everything on the SOAR app? So um, I dug into this with um, Jen Kay, who's so amazing. And she's going to try to work with the SOAR company to make sure that um, if you're in middle school, you're looking at literature that's more middle school based um, as opposed to the whole big picture. So. It, you know, I think it was um, maybe Patrick Warren who said, or somebody who said this evening that um, you know we have to be open to kind of having conversations about things that are working and things that aren't working, and, and always try to be getting better at what we do and making sure that um, we're meeting the needs of all kids. So that's what this inventory really is about: is just making sure that developmentally we know what um, books kids have in their hands in classrooms. Um, so, like all things, and I think just because I'm a marketing communications person, I like the communication breakdown. What is the communication that's happening with our educators, with our teachers in the classroom, so that as we're talking about what the process is, that we feel that we're supporting them um, in terms of what their decision-making process is, right? So it doesn't feel um, or doesn't appear punitive, um, but more of, you know, I think it's just in the messaging and, and how you continue to support them. I'm not saying that we're doing anything wrong. I'm just curious in terms of what that communication process is with the educators. So we, um, we actually were at the middle school today talking mm -hmm. to the administration, a few teachers, and, and Linda gave an example when we were talking is there's a, a sixth grade teacher who has a library and she she uh, told Tracy, my library said, I know everything that's in it. Great, go, like, we don't, there's no inventory required. You know what's there. Mm -hmm. um, we're not trying to take the autonomy away mm -hmm. from teachers at all. They're the professionals in their classroom. We just want to know, um, them to know what they're putting in students' hands. 
So. And, there, and I think that some teachers, and rightfully so, are reluctant to make that decision too. And so we honor that as well. And that's that's the reading piece. And um, you know, there's there's only so many of us that can be reading away. So it's a process. You know, it, it won't happen overnight. Um, but we're chipping away and, and, and a little grace. Just and, getting through this process. And you know, um, grade level um, meetings happen every week with our, our coordinators in that content area. So there's there's time for dialogue. There's time for conversation. Um, Patrick and I are going to the middle school next week for um, a voluntary meeting with the language arts teachers if they want to come and talk and kind of problem solve. So because um, they voice their frustration yeah. to us, and we want to get it. Thank you. Does anybody else would like to speak? Hi. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry? I'll just write my name down. Oh, okay. I'll introduce myself. Yep. Um, I didn't plan anything official. Um, I just wanted to very quickly say my name is Lisa Lehman. I live in Justine uh, Drive in North Haven. And um, I was very happy to see uh, Mr. Lawrence um, come tonight and provide uh, such a detailed uh, report on what he's been involved in. Um, my, our daughters are older, um, and I'm excited that they've been able to see the arc um, bend this way towards the end of their career here at the North Haven Public Schools. Um, they are um, it's happy to see it as well, and um, I would like to see more of that information. Um, from Mr. Lawrence and from um, the folks he's working with to understand better how it's being implemented in all the schools. And I echo the need to make sure that the elementary schools are um, also a priority in this whole process. And um, I'd also like, I think someone else said uh, that um, to give the students a voice in this process, um, they are the ones who are in the classrooms. They are the ones who are hearing the words and the comments and the side conversations um, and I think a lot of them uh, right now don't know where to go if they think something is not happening the way it should like I know that there's been times that my daughters have come home and told me stories and I said well, what did you do about it and they're like I didn't, I didn't know what to do about it so I, I think the diversity clubs are, are a great start but um, I'd like to see to fold in more of the students um, to have a voice, to have um, a safe space to share experiences and, and their thoughts on it as well. Um, but I do applaud this group and all the work that's being done for that. I think it's, it's absolutely fabulous, and thank you. Um, I just had one personal question. I am, I believe, one of, well, we are <laughs> one of two families with uh, seniors this year who also attend ECA, and the graduation is the same day. So who can I talk to about possibly making it to both, or what we do about that? I recommend you start with Dr. Dalai. Okay. And please, if you're comfortable, CC me on that. Okay. We can have that discussion. I, I don't know that it's possible, but I just was wondering. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Seeing that there's no one else, <clears throat> may I have a motion to adjourn the April 20th 2023 regular meeting on the Board of Education. Cool. I just wanted to uh, give a plug for Teachers Appreciation Week that's coming up in mm -hmm. May. I think our meeting will occur after that. And cool. I just want to thank, uh, we are so appreciative of all the hard work our teachers give to this school system and their professionalism and their high standards. And um, if I could, I'd give them all home books. But, <laughs> yeah. um, but just wanted to let them know that we truly, truly appreciate all the parts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so sorry. Uh, Ellie Mulligan, uh, State Street. Uh, just wondering when officially is the last day of school, isn't it? Usually voted on at this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Important business, right, Ellie? Yes. <laughs> June 16th. What is the last three days half days? And what? Last three days half days. Last three days are going to be half days of school? Yes, sir. Um, it's been sometimes the case where that's not decided till later. Oh. That has been the trend over the last, before my time. So um, it's something I would need to talk to the board probably that maybe. Okay. 
Thank you. Can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. <laughs>